today we're back in Colossians. Uh, I think I mislabeled it last week because we're starting in verse 16 because I went through verse 15 and a lot's going on here uh, in the book of Colossians. It's great. It's there, There's a lot of detail and I'm going to go through verse um, four of chapter three. So there's a lot to dig into here, but it's been a great study and this tells us a lot about our faith and, uh, and what we're supposed to do. So uh, let me pray and we will get in, into the word. Father God, thankful for your word, thankful for uh, the opportunity to be here. Lord, uh, just uh, love this fellowship and, and the people here. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, you would help me uh, just rightly divide your word. Lord, that it would be clear and that you would uh, um, do for each heart as you would desire. Lord, uh, as we go into your word, bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we're going through the word, we want to keep a couple things in mind as we go through this. We always want to be thinking of what is God saying to me specifically in his word? What does God want to teach my heart and mind in the word? And then what are you going to do about it? What is the application? So we're, we should be continuously looking for application in the things that are happening in the word. And then day by day, hopefully, and is hopefully reading ahead every day during the week, you come and you're, you're looking to think, oh, what are the questions that are going to get answered that I maybe didn't get answered during the week. So starting in verse 16 of Colossians 2, it starts like this. It says, therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink or in the matter of festival or new moon or Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things to come. The substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels and claiming to access the visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions and their unspiritual mind. He doesn't he doesn't hold to the head from which the whole body is nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons and grows with the growth from God. So that little section there, so there's a, there's a trick here when you, it's not really a trick, but when anything starts with therefore, you have to ask what it's there for, right? Just remember that. Therefore, hey, what is that there for? So remember, Paul is addressing whatever heresy is going on in the Colossian church. It's widely accepted that the heresy is Gnosticism, where it says that the flesh is evil and the spirit is good. <coughs> And therefore, Jesus never actually came in the flesh, which if you change the person and work of Christ, you've changed salvation or negated salvation in your mind. Not actually, but what he's fighting against is this notion that Christ can be anything but what God the Father has ordained him to be in his person and work and his salvation. So, so you can't just say that. I mean, you can say it, but it doesn't make it true. So a couple of things that have been uh, important, Paul, Paul has said in verse 7, being rooted and built up in him, being Jesus, established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Right? So he's saying, therefore, be filled up. And then in verse 8, he says, be careful. Right? Be careful that nobody takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit. And then he goes on to talk about, uh, you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your faith, and now you're made alive with him, and he forgives us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of death. Uh, and its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and was taken away by nailing it to the cross, right? So he's made this case that Jesus, who is God, all God and all man, has come in the flesh and he's taken away the certificate of death that's owed us because of our sin. And when he says, therefore, right, therefore, because Christ has done that, don't let anybody re, uh, judge you with regard to food or drink in the matter of festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath day. They're a shadow of what is to come. The substance is Christ. Now remember, this is a culture in the Old Testament where they looked forward in the Old Testament uh, rituals and stuff when they had the festivals and the new moons and the, uh, all the calendar that, that God had set up. 
It was to remind them that they needed to have faith in the Old Testament that Jesus would come and do his redemptive, salvific work, right? They were to have this constant reminder, and their faith was to be in knowing that Jesus was going to come and ultimately save them from their sins. So what Paul is saying, <clears throat> now Christ has come and he's fulfilled that, when he says that those things are a shadow, it just means that, hey, look, they were foretelling what was going to happen, and now Jesus has come. So just imagine this. If now, because the sun's over there, if you were standing on this side of the building and the sun was behind and somebody's walking there, right, you would see their shadow on the ground before the person appeared. You would know, oh, oh, that person's coming. And then you could, like, if it was me, I'd try to scare somebody, bah, when they walk around, <laughs> walk around the corner, right? Uh, so, so that would have been the picture. Hey, when you see somebody coming, when the sun is behind them, you see the shadow cast, and you know then, then that person's coming, and then they're going to be right in front of you. So what he's saying there in that picture, it would be, it would be just one of those things where, um, when he says it's a shadow now that Christ is coming, if I was having a conversation with Rod, right, and the sun was behind him, it would just be weird if I was talking to the ground to his shadow. That would be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> He'd be like, what are you doing? What are you staring at the ground? I'm over here, right? So he's making this analogy about the shadow that, hey, the, the, all the prophecy has been fulfilled. The Savior is here. Stop looking at the things that were a precursor to him because he's here now. You can look at the man Christ, right? The Lord Christ is before you. You, you. you don't need to look forward to the shadow of the coming man. He's here. So when he makes this analogy of the shadow, he's saying, hey, look, those festivals and stuff, they were important at the time, but the Lord Christ is in front of you now. Stop looking at the shadow. Look at the man God Christ, right? These are a shadow of the things to come. The substance is Christ, and we says substance, that's important for the heresy too, because he's saying we are full of substance, right? We are body, we are mind, we are spirit. Jesus came in those forms, so we know that he's here. Christ had substance. So stop looking for all this other stuff that you guys are looking for. Christ has come, right? That's the therefore, right? Therefore, stop looking at those things, because Christ has already come, and... Nobody should judge you because you're not doing those things, right? And what it's saying is that, hey, look, if you're doing what Christ demands, other people are judging you, and you're like, oh, what do I do? I'm practicing my faith as Jesus would have it, and people don't like it. Well, you know what? You know who's the ultimate judge? Christ, right? He's the just and the justifier. He's the only one qualified to judge. So this is different than if you have some hitch in your faith and a fellow believer comes to you and says, hey, maybe we should talk about the things that are going on in your life, right? But if somebody reaches in from the outside of the church or they have a doctrine that's not from the Bible, you shouldn't be swayed by their judgment because people are going to have opinions. I have opinions, right? If I'm espousing my opinion, you can dismiss it. If I'm reading from the Word, there's something to it, right? And so that's what he's getting at. Don't let anybody judge you in those things unless it comes from Scripture. Then you should think about it, right? Because people have all kinds of things that they've tried to add to Christianity that is not Christianity. There's a lot of heresies out there at that time and at this time. So he goes on in the next verse, let no one, uh, let no one condemn you by uh, delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels and claiming access to the visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their uh, unspiritual mind. Because people, right, first they judge, then they condemn, right? You, you've probably seen that. You've been in the world. You know how that goes. I judge you, and then I condemn you for doing the thing that you're doing, right? What Paul's saying is don't, don't let them do it. Don't sway your faith because somebody who doesn't know the Scripture is, is condemning you for something. And ascetic practices. That, so that is things where you're working on the appearance of your body, right? It, and, and it's one of those things uh, that as, as believers, sure, we, we, should, we should love our bodies, we should be thankful for it, and we should treat our bodies well, um, you know, with what we eat, what we drink, what we put in them. Some of us, like me, probably could do better at that sort of thing. But uh, what it's saying is some people will just say you have to basically torture your body or you have 
have to make sure you live in a certain way and control your flesh. But what Paul is going to get to later is that that doesn't have a lot to do with your spiritual things. So there's an outward form and appearance of that asceticism where you do that to look and be a certain way to show people, but your heart could be your heart could be bad. I mean, uh, Jesus even said to the Pharisees, uh, you, you, your, "Your bodies are like whitewashed tombs. They look good from the outside, but inside you're full of dead man's bones." So that's some of the practice that asceticism really does. Uh, bring on with people. And then it says the worship of angels claiming to have access to the visionary realm. So at that time, you know, along with the Gnosticism, there's, uh, there's all kinds of stuff like uh, all kinds of stuff like that, where, you know, there are angels and visions and that sort of stuff. And there is a biblical place for that. Joel says that in later times, your, your uh, young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will dream dreams, right? So, so it's there in, but people are searching for the fantastic and they'll make all these sort of things up. <coughs> you see some of this, you see some of this uh, even in the Catholic religion where so many things have come in and they have all these saints that you pray to, but they're not, you know, um, they're not God, they're not worship. You know, the Bible tells us clearly that there's one mediator between God and man and it is Christ Jesus and access to the visionary realm. And you may, you may or may not know this, but this is actually pretty common in our day. Uh, there is uh, what you call the New Age movement. It's, it's out there. It is just a reboot of the old uh, Hindu religions. It's a, uh, uh, you know, it's a, polytheism where they believe there's many gods and you have access to the gods and you have access to the spirit realm if you do a seance or something like that and there's uh people get into crystals and astrology right it's all to look out for that and and i've seen a number of believers who uh then with their christianity they're like well i have crystals and i look at i look at the horoscope every day that's a completely different religion you're trying to connect with something that's not right out there. It's not biblical. A lot of that can be occultic and demonic, but it's got an uber-spiritual sort of uh, feel that people really love. And so there's a reality to it that that can be very bad. It can be damaging to your faith because what you're looking for is, is something to be fantastic and give you a look into the future or the spirit world or some, some crazy knowledge, and it works out poorly. I don't know if you guys remember the account in the Bible where the first uh, king of uh, Israel, Saul, he's fallen out of favor with God and he goes to see a medium and uh, he calls the prophet back. I don't know how that works. It's just weird because <laughs> we, I think it is, uh, and, and, it, and he dies the next day, right? And the Lord tells us specifically, do not do those things. Do not have idols. Don't look into that. And so the importance of understanding what the word is and who the Lord Christ is to make sure we stay away from those things and you're careful with them. And it's, it's kind of alarming to me how many Christian people have with a society that that sort of uber spiritual new wave new age thing has actually crept into a lot of people so so we have to stay away from that because that is not of Christ it's not uh, it, it's not the visionary realm is something that Christ didn't give us right and most of us I don't know anybody who's an actual prophet right and that's a different thing than the visionary realm but even some brands of Christianity have gotten into that uber spiritual, like I get a prophecy from God all the time and they're looking for, for visions and stuff. And sometimes they're getting them, but not from God. But such people are inflated with empty notions in their unspiritual mind. Now that's interesting because as we talked about it, I said spiritual or uber spiritual a couple of times. And it's interesting that he said unspiritual, but he's talking about uh, when you're talking about biblical spirituality, you're seeking, seeking God, the things of the word, the Lord of the word, the spirit of the word, and that's what true biblical spirituality would be. But what he's talking about is the unspiritual mind that's looking for some sort of fantastic show, some f sort of uh, 
like all the stuff we just talked about. So when he talks about unspiritual, you're ungodly in your spirituality if you're looking for these things. So that's not the kind of spirituality that you want to have. Anything but Christ-like spirituality is unspiritual stuff, and it's it, it could be a road to damnation, right? It's very important. So when he lays this out in the person and work of Christ... He's saying stay away from these things because the importance of making sure you stay on track with the scripture is supremely important. So then he goes on here uh, in verse 19, and they don't hold on to the head from which the whole body is nursed and held together and the ligaments and the tendons which grows together from God. So he's used, Paul's used the analogy of uh, the body of Christ, right? And, and it's all together and it's ligaments and tendons and it, it's other places where it says, well, you can't say that in the body of Christ that everybody should be an ear or a toe, right? Everybody has a different um, purpose in the kingdom of heaven, right? Just like the, our eyes have a different purpose than our ears and our fingers have a different purpose than our toes, right? So, so there's a pretty clear analogy there, but he says, don't, uh, they don't hold on to the head from which the whole body. Now just think about that. If we're thinking about the head of the church, who is Christ Jesus, who gave us his word, he gave us the word of the Lord. He is the Lord of the word. And what he's saying is if you're unplugging from that, you're unplugging from the fountain of knowledge and everything that God wants for us. So if you think about your faith, if you think about um, just detaching from the head, I don't know, I lived, in the, I lived in Texas for a while, and I saw the kids, they could remove the head from a cockroach, and it would keep co- cockroaching for a while. The thing would like live on for a while. It's it's dead though, right? Because <laughs> after the, if there's a, if there's an apocalypse, it's going to be cockroaches and Twinkies left, right? And so it'd go for a while, but it would soon die because it can't eat, it can't drink, right? Anything like that. <coughs> if you remember in uh, history, there's a thing called the guillotine where they put people in there, and their punishment is to chop their head off. When you lose your head, it's disconnected from the body, and you die pretty quickly. Right? It's a pretty visceral analogy of, look, if you lose your mind and your faith, if you detach from Christ's word, Christ word, which is the head of the faith, the head of the body, your faith is pretty quickly going to die. So in this analogy, it's no small thing because the minute you disconnect from the word, boy, you're disconnected, and everything that you do, your thinking, your breathing, it dies, Right? So the importance of the whole body there, you can have the, you can have the best shape of your, your body and you can live the most perfect life just like the Pharisees used to, but if you're not connected to the head of the word, you're in a dying faith. You're in an unfaithful faith. So that's what, he's, that's what he's getting on there. So going on in verse 20, he said, If you died with Christ to the elements of the world, why do you live as you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these have the reputation of wisdom by promoting self-made religion and false humility they, uh, and severe treatment of the body, they do not have any value in curbing self-indulgence. If you died to the elements of the world, why do you still live as you belong to the world? The picture is when you come to faith, when you realize you're a sinner in need of salvation, and you make the confession, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then you're indwelled with the Holy Spirit because that's the promise, that's what happens. Then we have died just like Christ died and were raised to the newness of life. There's the picture in here, the picture of baptism. So when we, when we did baptisms recently for you guys, you go under the water, it signifies that you're dying to your sin and being raised to the newness of life. Right? So we have this new life in Christ. We have the ability not to live uh, uh, as, as you want to, but how to live as you ought. You have some freedom to live a Christ-like life. So if you've died with Christ, why do you live as you still belong to the world? 
That's an int- he just puts that question out there. <coughs> so what, are, what does that even mean? Because the world is backwards. Let's take, say for instance, uh, say, say for instance, if you had some sort of problem, let's say you were a heavy drinker for years or you used drugs or pornography, the world would say, get clean from that so you can have control over your life. Not a bad mode of thinking, right? Not a bad way to live. You should live sober. You know, it's going to be good for your mind and your liver and your longevity. There's nothing wrong with that, but it would say, you overcome that in the flesh and always control it. And that can work for some people, but maybe you still live like you used to. But what he's saying that you've died to the elements of the world, right? So you look at it very differently because Christ died and your sin died with him. Now, You don't want to control that from a thing of, I always have to be in self-control over that thing. It is now that I am free in Christ because of my salvation. I don't always have to work to control my flesh. I can give it to Christ. My flesh has been taken off, and I have a spirit of God. And because God did that for me, I want to live a Christ-like Christ-like life. It's a totally different way of thinking, right? The outcome on the outside might, might look the same, but you do it all from an internal way of thinking. Christ set me free, therefore I want to live like a free person. As a free person, I get to choose, I want to be more Christ-like. Christ is, you know, look at the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. God says be sober-minded, be vigilant, be wise. Uh, don't uh, make the most of time because the days are evil. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians says. So, so when he says, says this, the world says you have to live this way out of compulsion to look a certain way to be a certain way. Christ says, I set you free. You can live a certain way. All your hurts and all the things that have happened to you and all your sin are washed away. And you know what? I'm going to make you a new person. And when you fail, I'm going to pick you up and dust you off, Lord, the, the Lord says, because he loves you. When you fail in the world, it says, well, you failed. You better get up and you better get up and be better than before in your flesh. Well, that's real hard because then you have the sting of failure, no forgiveness, and you have to work harder. See how that works? When we're living again with the elements of the world, we don't belong to the world anymore. And he's also referring to the things, all those festivals that you had to follow and that sort of stuff. You don't have to follow those anymore because Christ is here. Christ has done it for you. And why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what was destined to perish being used up. And they are human commands and doctrines. So here's where it gets hard, because in this freedom that I just talked about, what he's saying is that, is, is Paul saying in Christianity there's no rules? You're free? <laughs> it's a hard question, right? Because he's kind of saying that, but he's referring to what these, are, what, these, what these are doing. But just know that he's not negating the law. <coughs> Remember that the Old Testament came in three parts. Moral civil and ceremonial and those civil laws and ceremonial were set up for a time and place that that they practiced those things looking forward to Christ and the civil law the civil law is something that we still have and the moral law so so think about this the moral law is the 10 commandments the civil law are things like the speed limit is 75 on the interstate don't go faster than 75 or 80 or 85 whatever it is that day <laughs> uh so, so we still have those things, but, but what he's saying is you have a freedom to exercise those sorts, exercise things in your life. Because with the civil law, there was a lot of things like, look, you couldn't eat, if, if we were still under the ceremonial law, none of us could have bacon, or pork chops, or sausage, right? Because of the kosher laws. And, and they never knew how good bacon tasted. <laughs> they just didn't know. And, and so they had all these practices that came with the, with the ceremonial law. And some, 
And so some people were still imposing those things on there. Some places you'll go in Christianity and they say, well, you can't go to this place or you can't go to that place and you can never drink alcohol and you can, uh, you can never hang out with these people or associate with that person or you can't even associate with a person from another church. There's all these laws that are put down. Why? You've, you've been set free. And in the freedom is, is difficulty, right? Because there, like, just take alcohol. There is no biblical prohibition against alcohol unless you've taken the Nazarite vow. Well, I don't know anybody in the New Testament who's ever taken a Nazarite vow, right? Samson, for example, who was, was a Nazarite. But what the Bible does say, in your freedom, look, it says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, and each person, and this is a difficult thing, each person has to decide, hey, look, should I be drinking alcohol? Because I know people where, hey, they can, ha- they, can have a, they can have a pint of lager with dinner and they're fine and it's never issue. Uh, you know, some people in some cultures, you just drink wine with, with every dinner meal, right? It's not a problem. There are other people who are free to do that who maybe have struggled with it in the past and maybe should never ever have a drink because, because one is never enough, you know, one is too many and 12 is never enough. So each person in their faith needs to determine between them and the Lord what it is that God is calling you to. If you're a person that should never have a drink and God has told you that, don't have a drink. Just don't do it. There's, uh, there's a hundred, there's a hundred other things that you could think of in that context and other people will come in and tell you, hey, don't, don't do that. Don't go to this place. Don't go to that place. You know, uh, it, it, it just think about, I, I have a friend who's a tattoo artist. He's been a friend for a long time before I was a Christian. Sometimes I stop by the tattoo shop and say hi. This is a guy, we have great conversations about the Bible, and there's always, it, it, it's, you know, it's an interesting atmosphere, and some people will be like, oh, you went to the tattoo shop. I did. One time I even came out with a tattoo. <laughs> but, but guess what? I've prayed with people in there. I've talked, I've talked with Jesus about people in there. It's kind of interesting. You have the conversation. All of a sudden, people are whipping out their phones. And you'd be surprised the people who don't look like they would have a Bible app on their phone have a Bible app on their phone, right? So for me, that's a place I go. That's a thing I do. That may not be a thing that other people do, but I've had people say, do you think you should really go there? I'm like, yeah, I really should. I got a friend there. We talk about Jesus-y stuff and motorcycles and stuff, but... So each person in their freedom, you know, uh, all those things can be used up. You know, some people, some people maybe still eat kosher. Some people have all kinds of habits. If the Lord has told you a thing to do in your life, you should do what the Lord says. But that doesn't mean you have to impose it on everybody else around you because they have the freedom to do as they wish. And there's a fine line, like I talked earlier, where is somebody, somebody in their Christianity abusing, uh, uh, abusing their freedom and they're living a reckless life no matter what it is? And people, people, you know, when it goes back to that, uh, human commands and doctrines, we have to be careful because, you know, the Bible says, here's a verse that's butchered all the time back in Matthew, judge not lest you be judged because you will be judged with the same judgment. So what it's saying in this case is if you're looking at a fellow believer's life in the fellowship and you feel like there's something there, it says, judge not lest you be judged with the same judgment. Hey, look, we are supposed to look out for each other and adjudicate what the Bible says. And if there's a brother or sister that's in sin, we should address that, right? But what he says right after that, Jesus, he says, take the log out of your own eye before you go to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. What the Lord is saying, hey, look, if you're just being a Pharisee and pointing somebody else's sin out, not good. You're going to be judged harshly. But if by prayer and your humility and you are striving for holiness and maybe you've gained victory over something another person is struggling with, look, in your humility, because you want to help another believer live a holy life, you should go and talk to them in a godly way. Tell them, hey, I see sin in your life. Can I help you with that? Can I help you get to a place of of freedom in your sin? That's how it's designed. That's what we're supposed to do. That's different than human commands and doctrines. Because the Lord says we are supposed to be looking out for each other. We are supposed to be helping our brother in sin. But we're supposed to be careful not to get drawn into that same sin. 
very different what he's talking about from the world than the Christian belief that we're supposed to be living in this freedom with. So then he goes on, and although they have a reputation for wisdom by self-made religion and false humility, they serve the, and severe treatment of the body, they're of no value in self-indulgence. Look, and there's some, there's some out there that say, hey, look, the outward behavior that you show other people is just fine. An example of, of that in the Jewish religion, um, they would say, don't commit adultery. And they would say, hey, if you're not sleeping with anybody, that's cool. I would say that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you look upon a woman with lust, you've already cheated with her in their heart. So what he's saying here is the people who would say, even the Jews now today would say, hey, look, your outward action is just fine. You can be as lustful in your mind as you want. Just don't reach out and touch somebody. That's not congruent with the, what the Bible says. He's saying that they're, they're, that's a self-made religion because thoughts become words, words become actions. That's how it goes. So not only should you not have, you, you should be thinking to yourself and, and talking with other people, you should not even have the thought. In that safe self-made religion, it's a false humility because true humility it says, Lord, Help me take every thought captive. Help me not be lustful. Help me not be ang angry. Help me not be filled with, with rage or alcohol or whatever it is. And the other religions say, hey, look, if you can hold it together on the outside, you can think whatever you want on the inside. But it always spills out, doesn't it? We always talk about uh, the things, you know, <laughs> the kid, you know, with my kids and the teenagers. We talked about, I would talk about the situation with, hey, you should have a filter. You should not say everything that comes to your mind. I have a friend whose wife, he's in construction, his wife always tells him, say the third thing you think. Don't say the first thing, don't say the second thing, because you could say the wrong thing. Say the third thing. By that time, you should slow down and not say the thing that's on your mind, right? Because sometimes in construction, they use words um, <laughs> that are not appropriate for church, right? And then so you start that way, but the whole thing is, you know what, I shouldn't even be thinking that way. I shouldn't be thinking crass thoughts. I shouldn't be thinking angry thoughts. I should be taking that captive, right? So you see the difference between the man-made outward behavioral model. It's different from Christ is changing me from the inside out. I don't have those thoughts because I'm not thinking them anymore. I'm not as I, I, I'm not as judgmental of other people. I'm not as skeptical of other people. I don't, all those things, that whatever you have personally, over time in your Christianity, you should think, I remember thinking one time, I, I remember thinking, I really do, I really do love people. There was a time in my life when I looked around and be like, whew, some people are just not very likable, right? Some people, I didn't, I didn't have a deep love for other people. And some point in my Christianity, I remember thinking, I think about all humans different than I used to. I'm not nearly as sarcastic towards people as I used to, used to be. I'm not as, you know, all the things, and that's how it should be. Look around one day, I'm like, wow, I'm more Christ-like. Still kind of sarcastic sometimes, but that, that's okay. <laughs> Who doesn't like a little sarcasm? So then... <coughs> I went into chapter 3 because he's talking about there's no value in curbing self-indulgence. And why is that? Because he's going to go back basically to where he was at in the beginning. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden in, uh, with Christ in God. So think about that. Raised. Seek the things above in Christ, because he's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not earthly things. I think this is so important, because the world has, is in our ear all the time, right? It's in our ear about how we should think. And we look around, just turn on the news for a half an hour one day, and you'll be like, what is going on out there? And the people around us, and we're looking, we're looking at, you know, infl inflation is high, everything's real weird right now. Find, you know, see what's going on in the world, right? That's been going on forever. It's new to us. But if we remember that Christ has been raised, he has set us free from our sins. And we've, and we've accepted that through faith in our confession, right? And then when we look at the things above, we know it's important that God is seated at the right hand of, of the Father. In victory, in power, when he comes back again, 
we're going to go with them, right? And, and so, so our minds are set on things above, not earthly things. So when we see all these things in the world, I'm not suggesting you roll over and put your head in a, in a hole like an ostrich and, and, and bury your... I mean, we still have to navigate the world, but right? But when we get that, how are we going to make it? What's going to happen? What, what is the economy going to be like? What, we should look at Christ and go, look, there's an eternal perspective, It could go as bad, and this is kind of where I go sometimes, it could go bad as I could possibly imagine it on earth. And you know what I have? My salvation is intact. My relationship with Christ is intact. And I look at things like Paul in in Acts when he takes a beating and then he gets changed with Barnabas in the inner prison and he's singing a hymn. That's an eternal perspective. Because I can't, I mean... I was young and I used to do, you know, fighting and I wrestled a long time. I never remember taking a beating and being like, yay, let me sing a hymn. That's never how I felt once, right? <laughs> but, but if it happens now, if there's persecution, I would hope that my faith is like that, that I'm going to be like, this is temporary. And because of Paul viewed Christ, how this says right here, this is why Paul is saying it, what happened after he took a beating and he's in prison? He's singing a hymn. And it's affecting the people around him. God shook the earth and, and the jail cells opened. The jailer thinks he's going to die. He's about to kill himself. And Paul says, don't do it. And because of that, the man and his whole family come to faith and the Philippian church is born. Eternal perspective gives us the thing, this is temporary and it hurts, but guess what? I have eternal hope. That's why Paul acted like he did. That's why when he says this, it's so important because if he would have just been focused on the beating and the prison, we wouldn't, that guy wouldn't have salvation. He, is, he, is, he and his whole family, right? And we wouldn't be talking about it now. Eternal perspective. And that's what, that's what I've been working on this week, eternal perspective, because a lot of things happen. And I'm like, oh, this again? Are we doing this again? And sometimes I'm stuck in that. And I really sometimes am stuck duck with my feet on the ground instead of eternal. So truth be told, I'm really working on that eternal, eternal perspective. And the reason why we should do that, back to what he said at the beginning, you've died. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. You and I as believers, for sure, at the end of it all in that eternal perspective, we're going to be in heaven with Christ. None of this nonsense that we live through now is going to be around anymore. Christ the victor will do everything that he said he will in in the prophecies that are laid out before us, and we'll be in glory with him. When we have this eternal perspective, when we live this eternal perspective, and this is what I'm going to be thinking about this week, because, you know, like I said, Garrett's going to be here next week, but I'm going to be thinking about this this week. How, How often, my question to myself is, my question to myself is, how often do I have an earthly perspective? As I started thinking about this week, I was kind of alarmed that maybe I'm not as where I thought I really wanted to be in my faith and my relationship with Christ. I really, I, so I'm going to really scrub that this week and see how that goes. I would encourage you to do the same thing because we all should ask that ourselves. And the reason for that is closeness with God, our assurance of heaven, and hopefully, like Paul hopefully without a beating in prison, but if that's what it is, hopefully because of my eternal perspective, people in the world are going to look at us and believers and say, I want that life. If you look at all the agendas that are out, out there in this world, I have to believe, I have a lot of hope that when those things collapse on those, collapse on those people and all the people out there and all the agendas are hurt and broken and empty, we're going to have a great opportunity for all the things in the news that we don't like right now to share the gospel with people who are lost and broken. It's coming. And if we have that eternal perspective, all the stuff that, that's going on now, those people and those agendas are going to be people we're going to be able to go, let me tell you about my Christ. Because he's on the throne, and I'm going to go with him, and I want you there with me. That's what our perspective of eternity should lead us to. Amen? Father God, thankful for your word. Lord, just uh, blessed every week as, as I study it and uh, particularly challenged this week and probably challenged in the week to come. But uh, I'm thankful for that, Lord. And I just pray that each of us would just uh, 
we would just seek you and what are each one of us ask you specifically lord is my perspective eternal or is my perspective here on earth lord and then um as we ask that question that you would uh dig out of us whatever our flesh is holding on to lord and i know that's i know for me that's a difficult thing and sometimes it hurts when you do that lord but it's so good when i'm closer with you and uh, my heart is aligned with you, so I so I ask you, even even in the difficulty, if you bring me through it, Lord, that you would you would give me the joy of knowing that it's going to be better uh, at the end of whatever you're going to teach me. And the same for everybody else out there, Lord. I just thank you and praise you for uh, everything that you do, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen.